Welcome everybody to day one of the first Spring One Tour session of 2021. We are thrilled to be able to connect with more of you virtually for the second year in a row. We do miss the tours of yesteryear where we would go to connect with you in person in exciting places like Istanbul and Seoul, Johannesburg, Paris, Denver, but with microservices on Kubernetes in the clouds, the name of the game is scalability. So we're really glad to be able to make this year's tour available to everyone anywhere. So this year, we're going to try out a new format. Day one is going to be a webinar, and day two is going to be a hands-on workshop. So today is day one, and today we're going to welcome a panel of presenters. They're all hailing from the developer advocacy group at VMware, who will cover a slew of topics relating to the theme of the day, which is running Spring Boot apps on Kubernetes. And so we have a couple of hours of content for you. We're gonna cover many different topics that are gonna show you how easy it is to get a Spring Boot app running on Kubernetes and also different ways that you can make your apps more production ready. So today, if you've joined us, you already know that we are streaming on our VMware Tanzu channel on Twitch. Make sure that you check out all the other shows under this channel. You can find them all at the link Tanzu, T-A-N-Z-U dot TV. We've got a bunch of great shows. Definitely check that out. And on that same site, Tanzu TV, you'll see a banner at the top that says Tanzu Developer Center. So check that out too. There's a lot of great content. There's blogs, there's more videos, there's workshops, all kinds of stuff relating to modern applications and platforms, and it's all free. So um, before I introduce the speakers of today, I want to give you a quick insight into day two, which is tomorrow. We're going to be hosting a live hands-on workshop. So that's going to be held in a regular Zoom session rather than a webinar like this. So there's going to be more opportunity for more active participation. We're going to split up into breakouts, and each breakout will have a couple of hosts. And we're going to go through the deployment of a Spring Boot app on Kubernetes, and we're going to cover a few cool features that might come in handy for you. Um, for tomorrow's workshop, just be aware, you do need to pre-register, and the registration deadline is 3 p.m. Pacific time today, which is five hours from now. Uh, so if you want to be part of the hands-on workshop, please do sign up before the deadline. And also, workshop attendees are going to get a special edition of Booternetis swag. So that's exciting. Now, for our webinar today, you might simply be watching on the Twitch um, stream right now. And of course, uh, if you have any questions, uh, during the webinar today, please log into Twitch so that you can post questions in the chat. We're going to be watching that Twitch stream chat for questions and answering as the webinar goes on. So that having been said, let me introduce our presenters. As I mentioned, we've got a handful of speakers from the developer advocacy team at VMware. Specifically joining us will be Josh Long. We also have Nate Shuda. I don't know if uh, Mark Heckler, Paul Tchaikovsky, Tiffany, there we go, there we go hey Paul, uh, Tiffany Jernigan, there we go, and I will be making an appearance later on as well. And I do want to thank the folks uh, who make this possible behind the scenes. We wouldn't be able to do it without them: Tasha Eisenberg, Jamie DiMartini, and Ivan Tarin. So let's get started. Let me turn it over to Josh Long to kick us off. Hi, Spring fans. We didn't move to microservices because we cared about the size of the code base. The size of the code base is only a reasonable proxy for the size of the team. And that's what we care about. The size of the team impacts our ability to deliver software. The more people involved, the more work that has to be done to stabilize and integrate changes. The more people that have to be involved in every little step along the way to production. So everything we can do to reduce the sort of surface contact with other groups in the organization, the better. Everything we can do to, to increase autonomy, the better. Microservices are all about giving us autonomy. The idea being that if you have a small code base, you have small teams, they're focused on one thing and they can see that work deployed into production more quickly, more readily and without any intervention from other parts of the organization. We care about that because it allows us to iterate, to see an idea delivered to production where our customers can benefit from it and feedback and tell us whether we've built the right thing or not to validate what we've done. That said, when you move to microservices, you invite new complexities, new technical costs, new debt that you have to pay down. And so today, we're going to look at ways to stand up software that's intended for production and look for ways to pay down some of the 
that technical debt, to reduce that complexity. And we're going to do that by embracing consistency and automation to get velocity, right? Through consistency comes velocity, and that's what we want. I hope you enjoy your time with us today. Take lots of notes, and remember, we are here uh, for you. You can find our contact information at the very end of this video, uh, and we are happy to answer questions during this session and beyond if you want to engage. Today we're going to use, as usual, uh, Java. We're going to build a new application called the Customers Application. Uh, we're going to add some dependencies, R2DBC, H2, the Reactive Web Support, Lumbuck, and I think that'll do. That'll give me everything I want. Uh, we have the choice, of course, of, of which packaging we'd like to use. The choice is between jar and .war. Obviously, obviously here I'm a big fan of uh, .jars. This is in keeping with my overarching guiding personal philosophy of make jar, not war. I encourage you to do what works for you and then accept it and embrace the defaults. Then we have which version of Java we'd like to use. Java's 15, 11, or 8. Before you, my friends, we have three radio boxes, but really only two choices. So I encourage you to do the right thing and it's accept at least Java 11 or the current supported version of Java, which is Java 15. Okay, so we're going to build a brand new application that takes advantage of reactive programming. Reactive programming gives us three benefits, consistency, r robustness, and scalability. It gives us scalability because it gives us a programming model that allows the runtime to constantly recapture threads and repurpose them for other work. This means that you're never ever in a situation where, as you would be, for example, with traditional I.O., where your services are mostly idle, they're blocking, waiting for something to happen, so all the threads are unusable, and yet your CPU is relatively idle. Reactive programming allows us to better repurpose the threads that we have in the runtime so that they're always busy, they're always hopping, they're always doing something. It also gives us a programming model that supports reliability, right? The ability to uh, make calls to downstream services, to handle errors, to degrade gracefully, etc. Reactive programming also gives us consistency. It gives us a programming model that allows us to think about all the disparate uh, sources and sinks for data, be it from a WebSocket endpoint or an RSocket endpoint, a HTTP endpoint, a database, a message queue, etc and to deal with all the different dimensions uh, around that data. Does the data come all at once? Does it come in a slow trickle? Is it infinite? Does it go on uh, for just 10 records and then stop? These things are all things that you have to think about. It gives uh, a lot of, it makes life a lot more confusing to have to contend with all that. Reactive programming gives us one single interface with which to deal with that allows us to, to describe all those kinds of data sources and sinks. And so in this way, it better, it better supports composability. So we're going to build a brand new application that's going to talk to a SQL database. Uh, that SQL database is an in-memory H2 database. Uh, and because it's in-memory and embedded, uh, every single time the application restarts, we're going to lose all of our data. So it's going to... It's going to um, okay, so we're going to uh, build an application that talks to a database, and we need a repository to handle the tedious, sole annihilatingly boring read, write, update, and delete data management lifecycle chores. And to support us there, we're going to create a reactive CRUD repository. This repository has methods that do all the normal things, save, delete, count, check if they exist, etc. What may not be so familiar, however, are the parameter types, uh, a publisher, for example, which comes from the org reactive stream specification. A publisher is a thing that publishes data asynchronously out of band to a subscriber. When the subscriber first connects, it is given a subscription. We'll double click on that in just a second. When their new messages are delivered, they are delivered to the on next method. When and if there are errors, they are delivered here to the on error method. And finally, when there is no more data to be processed, the on complete method is called. Now, this subscription, this first thing that we're given, is arguably the most important part here. The subscription is how the subscriber asks for more data or stops the flow of data altogether. This is called flow control or back pressure. We've got three types here, publisher, subscriber, and subscription. We've also got processor, which is a bridge. It's a publisher and a subscriber, a consumer and a producer. And these four types are the reactive stream specification. They're foundational, so foundational in fact that they're now in JDK 9 or later. So Java Util concurrent flow dot processor subscription Etc. Right. So these types are interchangeable. There's even a uh, a class that's included in the reactive streams type called flow adapters, which allows you to convert from Java Util concurrent flow publishers 
to uh, Reactive Streams publishers and vice versa. These types are foundational, and so we use a project like Project Reactor to build upon them, to give us operators to make the data flow composition that we want to do much easier. And so we have two specialized publishers, the first of which is Mono. And Mono comes from Project Reactor. It publishes at most one value asynchronously, and it supports back pressure. A flux, on the other hand, produces an un potentially unbounded amount of data. It could produce zero, one, five, a trillion, infinite, etc. They're both publishers, but they also have these operators, things like combine and you know map and flat map and generate and just and uh, you know all these things that you want to to be able to make working with data much easier. So now we have our reactive repository, and I want to initialize some data in the database. Okay, we're going to create our listener. That gets invoked when the application starts up. Application listener, application ready event. And when the application starts up, we're going to inject a database client to make it easier for us to execute, execute SQL against the database and an instance of our repository. I'm going to create a reactive stream with some names. I'm going to save it to the database using flat map. So flat map will unpack the intermediate result return value uh, and give me the view of the resolve thing. So to show, show what I mean, repository dot save customer. So you can see that the result there now is a stream of customer, not a stream of uh, mono of customer. Now I also want to make sure I update the database schema itself. I need to create the database schema. So I'll say var ddl equals dbc.sql create table if not exists customer id serial primary key name var car 255 not null dot fetch dot rows updated. There's that. So now I've got these two different reactive things. These won't execute, however, until you activate them. So you say ddl.subscribe. The trouble is that subscription, uh, which causes the, the reactive pipeline to be realized, is asynchronous. So there's no guarantee that this, or, in, or indeed the callback that you could provide it within, will get executed in the same thread, right? So we need to make sure that um, we, we, uh, we serialize things, that we force, thing, force things to happen one before the other. So calling dot subscribe wouldn't work, right? I can't do dot save subscribe like that. I can't be sure that this will succeed uh, this, right? I need one thing to guarantee to happen before the other. So I'm going to use operators. I'll say then many saved dot subscribe. I'm going to print out system out print line. All right, there's my updated code. Let's see, let's replace that. I think we're good to go. So now we have our reactive stream. Uh, we have our data. We're creating a reactive stream of names here. We've saved it to the database. We're going to need a HTTP endpoint. So I'll create a REST controller here. OK, there's our reactive stream. I think we've got everything we need here. Let's go ahead and run this and see what we get. So there we go. There's our application. It worked. Now, I want to build another microservice. So let's go back to start.spring.io, and we'll build another service. We're going to call this one the order service. We're going to use the R socket support, and that's it, basically. We're going to use Kotlin as well, just because we can. Uh, I'm going to hit Generate. Now we're going to open this up in our IDE. OK, we have a brand new order service. Let's take a look at it. We're going to create an application that serves up data through an RSocket endpoint. RSocket is great because it's a binary protocol. 
that reifies the concepts of reactive programming on the wire. That is to say, it supports back pressure on the wire. It also has the support for metadata frames, so you can communicate out-of-band information like tokens, which is ideal for things like security, something you can't really do, for example, in WebSockets. It supports many different message exchange patterns going beyond just the request response that's supported by something like HTTP. It was designed by engineers who had come from Netflix and went to Facebook to get around some of the limitations of gRPC and of HTTP. The result is an open source binary protocol that has many different client bindings. Uh, the Java client binding for which uh, is built in Reactor. So our, in order to create an RSocket service, we need to tell Spring Boot to stand up the RSocket server on a certain port. I'm just going to choose 8181. It's completely arbitrary. And then we can create an RSocket controller for order data. Now, some might argue that order data for the customers belongs in the bounded context for the customer as part of the aggregate. Uh, I would think that while that might be true from an ideal perspective, uh, order data has a different life cycle because you might delete that data separate and apart from the, the customer data. While you might delete customer data for privacy reasons, you're probably going to keep anonymized order data uh, for revenue recognition purposes and the, and the like. So uh, I tend to think of these things as separate, but there is a relationship there, right? One has a dotted line for a key to the other. So we're just going to create a little in-memory database, not, not anything fancy here. And our controller is going to manage data of type order. So I could say private val id int. I could say private val id int and you know give it a default value of negative one or null. But if I want to use null, I have to tell Kotlin about the nullability of the variable by adding a question mark. I could say I want to have a, a customer id int and that too would be question mark and it could be null. I could do all this kind of stuff, but then I have to create the getters, the setters, the toString, the equals, etc. So rather than do that, I'm going to use the concise syntax that Kotlin gives us for creating a constructor. So I could just say id int customer id int. Uh, but again, I want I want storage. I want not just a constructor parameters, but I want uh, fields and also getters and setters. So if I want just a getter, or rather, if I want just the storage, I could say private val. And that would create two private fields with no getters or setters. Uh, the fields themselves would be read-only. They'd be final. Val means read-only. I could make them mutable. I could say var. So now it's readable and writable. Uh, but I could also make them so that there's getters and setters for these things, kind of like classic Java beans. Now, this syntax still doesn't give me a two string or equals or hash code. To get that, I need to add data. So this is my basic entity. And I'm going to create a little in-memory database to manage all that data. So I'll say private val db equals mutable map of int to a collection of orders. And now I'm going to initialize the database. So I'll say init. And I'm going to loop through each customer ID 0 to 3, because I only created ABC, you might remember. And for each one of those, I'm going to create records for the database. So I'll say this.db customer ID equals random orders for customer ID. And you can see I need a function here. I'll create a function. So in order to create the data, I'm going to randomly synthesize some data. So I'll say val list of orders equals mutable list of order for order ID equals for order ID in uh, one to some number val count val max equals math dot random times a thousand dot two int so max And with that done, I want to then uh, add some data. So I'll say list of orders dot add order. And the first parameter is the order ID. And the second, the customer ID. Return list of orders. All that remains now is to create a controller handler endpoint. This will look fairly familiar if you've ever done HTTP, but it's not exactly the same. 
Okay, so we're going to return a stream of data. So we'll say flux dot from iterable, and I'll say this dot db customer ID. Now this will fail, and the reason it's failing is because it's expecting back a iterable value. So I will take it and turn it into a list. But even this fails, and you can see it's failing because to list is expecting to operate on the thing that's not null. And so the compiler is saying, hey, this, there's no guarantee that this lookup here, this dereference, is going to return a non-null value. So I need to tell it to not worry, to just trust me, I've got this. And so I can do that uh, by using the exclamation marks, which tells Kotlin to go ahead and make this potentially unsafe dereference, and I'll just worry about the null pointer myself. All right, let's go ahead and run this and see what we get. We're going to invoke the endpoint using the RSC command line utility. This is kind of like curl, but for R socket. There's my data. So the R socket endpoint is working. Our HTTP endpoint is working. So now let's go ahead and create a gateway. We're going to go back to start.spring.io and we're going to create a new module called gateway. And a gateway is a great place to, uh, with a minimal of intrusion, introduce these generic concerns uh, in a way that's applicable to all downstream microservices. So you don't, you wouldn't want to put a lot of business logic in the gateway or the edge service. Instead, you'd put generic things that can be repurposed, things like compression, routing, load balancing, rate limiting, etc. So we're going to build a module here that's using Spring Cloud Gateway, RSocket, and the Reactive Web Support. And we're going to create two different things. We're going to create an API gateway and an API adapter. Let's hit generate. I'm going to open this up. So now we have a brand new gateway module. The first thing that we're going to do is build an API gateway using Spring Cloud Gateway. So gateway route locator builder RLB return RLB.routes. And the contract here is very simple. You describe a route or many routes that have three things, predicates that match how incoming requests should be captured, right? And I can use arbitrary combinations here. I can say, okay, well, anything that goes to spring.io, you know, wildcard, wildcard spring.io, uh, and has a path of proxy, I want to then send on to localhost 8080. Now, the thing is, I want to send it on to 8080 forward slash customers. But the incoming request, by definition, will have a path of proxy. So I need to change the path because there is no such thing as localhost 8080 forward slash customers forward slash proxy. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a filter. And filters are the real power of Spring Cloud Gateway. You can change things like the downstream path. You can uh, do a circuit breaker. You can do retries. You can do rate limiting. You can do refresh. You can rewrite the, the query string. You can do all sorts of things here uh, to ensure that your services are responsive and consistently available, right? This helps you ensure that all of your services behave in a consistent way uh, and you have a declarative way to enforce this. Now I'm going to just leave it with just the path change, but that should work. It'll take the incoming request, strip away forward slash proxy, replace it with the customers, and then that'll get sent down to the local host 8080. Now I'm showing you the Java DSL, but there are a couple of other ways. There's actually a Kotlin DSL that's even easier. And because the API is so simple, you just have an interface of type route locator that has a return value of a stream of routes, a reactive stream of routes. Each route is in turn just the base parts that you saw me express in that DSL. It's a, a series of predicates, one or more predicates that match the incoming request. It's a series of filters that act on the incoming request. And it's a destination, a URI, to which the request should be sent when it's been processed. Because it's such a simple API, there's also a YAML configuration format that you can use uh, to describe these routes. That YAML configuration can live in the Spring Cloud config server, and that can be refreshed dynamically. In order for this to work, we need to specify an HTTP port. So server port equals 8888. And then let's restart the application. So curl HTTP localhost 8888 forward slash proxy. The host header will be test.spring.io and that should give us our data.
Now we can test that that actually works by changing the vhost header. So we can say, uh, well, test is fine, but it's this bit over here that has to change. Right? There we go, we got a 404. So that host header and the proxy path really help to determine how to route that. So that host header and the proxy path really help, really help to determine how to route that. Now, that's a simple Spring Cloud gateway. You can create all sorts of really interesting uh, combinations there. I did a whole video uh, recently for my Spring Tips series on Spring.io for such video, where I looked at Spring Cloud Gateway in a lot more depth. It's an hour and 40 minutes of tutorial depth introduction, so I hope you'll check that out. Let's now create a API adapter. An API adapter is not as generic and not as soft touch as an API gateway. I tend to put uh, you know, transformation logic in the category of API adapters. Anything having to do with taking data from an outside, outside client and adapting it to the downstream services falls under the purview of an API adapter. API adapters are, are a wheelhouse for reactive programming. It's a very natural place to take advantage of the compositional com capabilities of reactive APIs uh, and it makes it and, and and reactive APIs make it easier to uh, achieve scatter gather service orchestration and composition. So here's my class CRM client. So let's create an API adapter that calls both the RSocket endpoint and the HTTP endpoint and composes the data to create a new view of the data showing all the customers and all the orders for those customers in one view. This is a natural thing to do on the server side because we can do it with much more efficiency than the client would be able to if it had to connect to both an RSocket and an HTTP service. Not to mention, if we wanted to introduce security, we'd have to introduce it in both places, whereas now we can centralize that security behind the gateway. We're going to create a CRM client, and the CRM cl client, to do its work, is going to talk to the customer data store, the customer service. So we're going to use private integer ID, private string name. It's going to also talk to the order service. So we're going to have private integer ID and customer ID. We're going to create getters and setters and two string and all that. We're going to need Lumbach. So I'll add Lumbach back into the build. Okay. So we'll say at data, at all orgs constructor, at no orgs constructor. Paste that in there. And there's our basic DTOs, our client-side representations of the data. Now, in order to talk to these downstream services from our CRM client, we're gonna need uh, objects, client objects. So let's create those two beans, the first of which is the web client. This is for reactive non-blocking HTTP requests. So we're gonna just create the instance like so. We're also gonna need a RSocket requester. And the RSocket requester is kind of like a client, except that unlike most clients, this is uh, not truly a client in that both when, when an RSocket node connects to another RSocket node, either side can initiate the conversation, either side can be the requester or the responder. So uh, we don't really think about it as client service, we think about it as requester responder and either one can be either thing, right? So I'm gonna connect to localhost 8888 and that's it, that's my entire uh, connection. But notice that I'm connecting when the application starts up, as opposed to per request. Let's go to the client now and uh, build out these endpoints. Order, get orders for uh, customer ID. And publisher of customer. Get customers. Okay. And now I want to read the data using the different clients. So I'll inject the R socket requester. So I'll inject the R socket requester and I'll inject the web client. required args constructor. Now, let's do this dot uh, HTTP dot get dot URI HTTP localhost 8080 forward slash customers 
going to get the data, turn it into a stream of customer data. And for the rsocket data, I'll say this.rsocket.route orders C ID passing in the customer ID. All right, so there's our calls. Now, the thing is, things might fail, right? And we want to make sure that we have a toolkit to address that, those potential failures, right? As the network becomes bigger and the surface area larger, the possibility for errors also increases. So we want to take advantage of these nice operators that are built into our reactive APIs. Things like retry, right? So you can do a retry uh, with a back off, for example. Uh, you can do, uh, you know, on error resume, e flux.just, you know, fallback, right? You can actually provide default values there or empty, for example. You can do timeouts. So there's a lot of different operators that you can use for your different calls. Uh, and indeed, you can do it for both because they're both reactive streams. The retries and all that stuff have nothing to do with HTTP or with RSocket. They have, they have to do with these reactive APIs that we're using. And so in this respect, reactive APIs give us a toolkit for building more resilient, more robust services. You could see that this could, these things can be genericized, right? Uh, and so on. Okay, so now we've got two different endpoints. Let's build a new view of the data that is a synthesis of both. So customer orders, private list of orders, and private customer. All right. Now, create some getters, some setters, and two string, and all that. And I'm going to create a new endpoint here. I'm going to say this dot get customers dot flat map, and I'm going to for each customer. I'm going to want to keep a reference to both the customer and the orders for that customer. So I'm going to create a tuple. And the easiest way to do that is to use a mono, so dot zip operator. And here, I'll just say flux dot or mono dot just customer and get orders for customer dot get ID dot collect as list. Okay. And what that gives me down here is a tuple. So flat map this. So now let's flat map the result. And I can say that T1 is the customer and T2 is the list of orders. So I say new customer orders, tuple dot get T1, tuple dot get T2, and then that's it. Maybe it's just map. Yeah, there we go, map. So let's clean this up a little bit, replace with an expression. There we go. There's our customer's endpoint. Let's now go ahead and use this in action. So we'll create a simple uh, HTTP controller. Customer orders rest controller. And we're going to use our CRM client, our newly minted CRM client, and inject that here. COs, publisher of customer orders, get return this dot CRM client dot get customer orders. All right, let's go ahead and run it now that we've got our, our composite view. But for, before we do that, I want to just review, make sure everything looks correct. So we're connecting to localhost 80, that's the customer's endpoint. We're going to be connecting to an RSocket endpoint on port. No, that's not right. This is 8888. We wanted to connect to 8181. All right. Now let's restart. Let's connect to the endpoint. There's our data. It worked. Pipe that into JQ. And here you can see it says, We've got the customer data. Let's see if I can get back to the first one here. You can see it, it shows the customer and then the orders. 
So the customer data and the orders data are in the same map, in the same uh, structure. So it worked. So with that, my friends, we've looked at how to use reactive APIs to build more re reliable, robust services. You notice that along the way, we used data, we did SQL-based data access. We could have also done NoSQL. There's great support for security. We looked at a brand new protocol called RSocket, which makes building services even more robust and reifies the concepts of reactive programming on the wire. We looked at how to build gateways to re-centralize certain cross-cutting kinds of concerns. We looked at service orchestration and composition with reactive APIs. And we looked at uh, Java and Kotlin along the way. Now, we've only just begun. There's a lot more to be done here. And so I'm going to send this on to my friends, uh, and they're going to help get this code to production. Uh, to help them along the way, I'm going to add a few things to the build. The first thing that we're going to need is the milestone and snapshot repositories. We're also going to need to customize the way that the Maven plugin works so that when Mark looks at build packs later, this will be present. We also need to add the Spring Gravium native dependency. We need to extend our basic observability support by adding in Wavefront. In order to re resolve that Wavefront dependency, we're going to add the Bill of Materials Maven Palm. And then finally, in order to resolve that Wavefront version, we need a property. I'll go ahead and re-import those. Uh, I can't wait for you to see what those bits are about. Uh, we have a lot of exciting stuff coming up. So let's get this train on the tracks to production. I've created an application that handles reads. We read from two different microservices, but we've left on the table the discussion of writing. We don't have enough time to really fully explore that discussion, but I do want to briefly kind of illuminate the possibilities. And so to help us, I've turned to our pal, Nate Shuda, in a segment called Shuda Known Better. It should be clear that we've oversimplified things here just a bit. I mean, it's a teaching example, after all. This is much like your favorite physics teacher who said, let's just ignore air resistance. I don't want to be a buzzkill. I don't want to be that guy. But in the real world, we don't just read data, do we? It's pretty important that we be able to write data. Although for brevity and simplicity, we'll leave writes as an exercise for the viewer. So what should our very attractive and unusually intelligent viewers explore? This is generally where someone leaps up and says, did someone say events? Well, hang on a second. What do you mean by events? I mean, this is very much uh, depending on who you ask, you're going to get a different answer, which is part of why Martin wrote this excellent piece a few years ago talking about what do we even mean by event driven? You can make the argument that this is very much a in the eye of the beholder kind of problem. Now, there's a bunch of different event patterns, so the important question is which one would you say you're using? Now, the first one is event notification. This is when an event happens and the source system shouts into the void, something happened. Perhaps a new customer signed up, yay, we're excited about that. Or some system says, I need more cowbell. Now, in these instances, the event emitter doesn't care what happens next. So this has the obvious advantage of being highly asynchronous or yet another example of what I lovingly refer to as the zeroth law of computer science, high cohesion, low coupling. Now there are some downsides. There's always pros and cons to any technical decision we make. These systems can be difficult to reason about. What would you say you do around here? It can be hard to debug. It can be very difficult to figure out what's going on. This is why monitoring is such a critical part of these kinds of applications. It can be very, very difficult to lose the flow of what's actually going on inside this application. Now, the next example of event driven would be event carried state transfer, which is similar in the sense that the emitter shouts that something happened, but it includes some details. So let's say for the sake of argument that the customer updated their address. So the event comes out saying customer updated the address. And by the way, here's the new address. So event subscribers don't have to turn immediately around and say, I'm sorry, what did they change it to? So this is an example of tell, don't ask, something you may have discovered in Object Oriented Programming 101. If you'd like to know more about this, unsurprisingly, Martin has written about it. Now, one of the advantages here is this greatly reduces latency and there's much less overhead on the source systems with N number of subscribers all con constantly pinging back saying, well, tell me what changed, tell me what changed. The downside here, of course, is lots of data gets thrown around and of course, receivers have to be able to handle state.
Now, the next example would be event sourcing, which is where we record every single state change. And instead of worrying about this being some kind of a database structure, the event store itself becomes the source of truth. So yes, this is generally where someone brings up Kafka. If you would like to learn more about Kafka, go check out this wonderful introduction from my good friend, Mr. Berglund. Now, this is great for systems that have a strong audit log need or need to be able to recreate history. I actually worked on a system like this many moons ago. Of course, this kind of an approach hadn't been invented yet. So we actually had to have all these mirror tables of every single production table. And it was the foo log table where we recorded well, every change, when it happened, who made the change, what the old value was, what the new value was, et cetera, et cetera, because we needed to be able to recreate history. One of the big advantages of these kinds of systems is they make it very easy for us to run hypotheticals. What if this happened? What if that happened? We'll simply play it and see what, what, goes, what goes on. Now, it does mean evolving schemas can hurt, and it can actually be kind of difficult to replay when you've got interactions with outside systems. Now, yet another thing that gets talked about in regards to event driven is CQRS or command query responsibility segregation. Yes, Martin does have a write up on that. No one could have predicted this. And this is where you have one data structure for reads and another slightly different data structure optimized for writes. So this isn't event driven per se, but you often see it combined with these kinds of architectures. Now, you don't just have to take my word for it. If you'd like more depth on this topic, you can go ahead and watch this video that Martin recorded at a conference a few years back where he goes more in depth into what I just discussed. And not surprisingly, we've got some write ups as well on our dev portal. Now, this does prompt a question along the lines of well, what should we do? What's the right approach for us for our application? Now, there are three answers that work for every question you've ever gotten in computer science. There's 42, which is to tell who's well read. There is another layer of indirection, which is my favorite pattern as an architect. But the answer I have to give more often than not is, well, it depends. Now, at the end of the day, unsurprisingly, it's all about trade-offs. No one could have predicted this, but you, of course, know that. Now, this is generally when someone shouts, but, but hang on, I have another question. What about distributed transactions? How do I do distributed transactions in the cloud? And I have to be the buzzkill and say, I'm sorry, you don't. Don't kill the messenger. Now, frankly, this isn't terribly surprising because this is kind of how the real world works. I mean, imagine for the sake of argument, you need a new shirt. You want to freshen up your Zoom wardrobe. So you go order a fancy new shirt from your favorite online retailer. There's a return policy. Now, your retailer of choice doesn't just keep that transaction open until your return policy expires, do they? No, heck no. That sale is committed. That shirt has been removed from inventory. Your credit card has been charged. Now, if you send that shirt back, well, there's a series of compensating transactions that happen where we put that shirt back in the inventory and we issue you a credit. That's the same thing that happens for us. All right, well, that's enough of an interlude of the real world. Let's get back to the show. Take it away, Josh. I think our application is basically ready now, but we need to get the application ready for production. That means that we need to package it. And so to turn to that, we're going to turn to a segment with the cloud native aviator, Mark Heckler. Mark? Very nice. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, just let's take the next step at this point. We have a great application built. Now, how do we get it to production? And I guess just to back up just a moment, let's talk about uh, different options that are at your disposal. Now, obviously, we need to get it to a uh, some kind of a container-based runtime environment in the cloud, right? I mean, this, this is where the payoff is. And you have options. With Java applications, typically, uh, we deploy to a JVM. We, we run our applications using a JVM, but there are other options as well, like native images. And of course, we want to kind of talk about both, but uh, let's start with the JVM and kind of move into the, um, move into the uh, native image area. So uh, how do you get to a container-based runtime uh, deployment target? Well, you could do it the traditional way, which is write lots and lots of YAML. That's really exciting, isn't it? I mean, everyone just loves YAML. Oh, okay, no one just loves YAML. Uh, I'm thinking that that's, well, anyway. 
Uh, YAML is probably not the favorite option. It is an option. It will probably always remain an option, at least for the foreseeable future. But you can do that. And if you're well versed in that, if you're numb to the pain that comes with uh, creating YAML based deployments, then you certainly can continue with that. Uh, Spring Boot doesn't inhibit you in any way from doing that. Uh, but you know, we like to, uh, we take a developer first approach, and that's really not that developer focused, right? So, so hopefully there's a better way. And of course, there, there are better ways. Um, you have different ways that you can deploy applications to container runtimes and show you one path forward. So we have what I like to point to as kind of that first step, which is the Paketo build packs. Now, Paketo build packs are based on the build pack technology that was created uh, by Heroku and polished extensively by Cloud Foundry and the various Cloud Foundry contributors, uh, particularly Pivotal and VMware. But obviously, there are a lot of hands and a lot of thought that went into those. And uh, Paketo build packs are kind of a collaboration between uh, Heroku and VMware, who have tons and tons of it, and, uh, and others too. Uh, but we have tons and tons of experience in this regard to make the developer experience better. And again, I like to, to point back to that developer first focus because that isn't always the case, right? I mean, not all tools are equally uh, friendly and useful. And we like to think that by focusing on developers first, we make them the most friendly and useful. So if you're wanting to deploy to a cloud-based environment, typically what you do is you create some kind of a container image and you spin up containers based on that image. And again, you can do that with YAML, you can do that with other mechanisms, but the Paketo build packs kind of take your, your deployable unit, your application, and build that container image around it. So that's pretty incredibly useful. And, and it's not just for Java, as you can see here on the screen. Uh, it supports Java and .NET and PHP and several other uh, options as well. But it, uh, it, what it does is it inspects your deployable unit and creates that container image around it, which makes things pretty painless for you. Now, there are ways you can tweak it, several things you can do to make that process just very simple and straightforward. Uh, however, um, you know, that's kind of that, uh, that's that middle step, right? I mean, that, that's worlds above a YAML-based approach, but it still looks like we could maybe integrate that a little bit better into the Spring Boot um, chain of events that take us from starting an application to deploying a production application. So this is a great foundation. It's a great stepping stone, uh, but we don't want to stop there, right? It's just a start. Uh, so what I'm going to do is take the application uh, that Josh created earlier, and I'm just going to clone that. Let me bring over my terminal window here. That's not terrible. Okay, so uh, let's see. So I don't... Oh, yes, here we go. So I do have a uh, directory. So let me just do a get clone. Yeah, we'll clone that. And let's take a look here. So I'm going to open... Ah. Oh, I'm in it. <laughs> okay, that will work. And while that is coming up, now what I can do, uh, and again, just using the uh, build pack approach, is just do a pack build customers. And it'll take off and build that application. It'll do everything for me, and that works really, really well. But uh, I do want to, again, take that just a step further. So I'm going to open the palm, if IntelliJ can keep up. It's a little slash, but you know it'll it'll get there eventually. And what I want to do to start with is just to comment out a bit of information here, just a few of the properties here in my uh, build file. And that way, that allows me to uh, do a couple of things. That allows me to show you, well, for starters, uh, there are tasks here that we can execute. So we can build an image. Let me see if I can zoom in on that. Look at that. So we can we can build that image. And I can do that right here for my IDE. But I'm just going to uh, pop out and do it here at the command line because yeah, why not? That's typically the way uh, I'm going to roll here today. So if I can find my keys here, that's one of the hazards of having a microphone in front of you. Um, uh, it kind of blocks your view a bit. So I'm going to build the image. And this is just using a, a JVM-based deployment. Uh, so that's, I mean, it's pretty quick. 
And, and this is one thing that I do want to highlight because every approach has trade-offs, right? So you have different frameworks, different options for building um, building applications and deploying them to cloud platforms, uh, deploying them to container runtimes, and they all have various trade-offs. Now, this is you know a pretty straightforward, um, pretty pretty straightforward effort, if you will. It's it's something that you're probably very used to uh, doing already. It's just that the build packs by integrating them into that uh, build image. Um, takes a lot of any additional effort on top of what you would normally do just for a normal build um, cycle and handles a lot of that heavy lifting or really pretty much all of that heavy lifting for you. So it's just pretty much the same effort that you do normally just to, to do a test run of your application. So this makes it pretty painless. Uh, and at the end of this, coming out the other end, what we will have is a container image checked into our local uh, local repo. And once this finishes, we'll take a look at that. While that's finishing up though, uh, I didn't have time to get into the next point, but I'll get to it momentarily. So if I do a Docker, uh, yes. If I do a Docker, uh, no, I don't want to remove. I just want to check out the images and we'll do a grab customers. And we can see that we have a, a an image here that we can go ahead and run, but I, I do want to continue on because I do have other things that I want to cover in the short time that we're here together. But this builds a container image based upon uh, our application using the Paketo build packs and a standard JVM deployment. So the nice thing is that this is a very familiar and comfortable uh, routine that we just did, but we can actually extend that quite nicely. So I'm going to uncomment this and go ahead and refresh my dependencies. And what I've done is just add a couple of things, really. I mean, this is just an, a useful argument for down, this, down the road, and we'll cover that momentarily. But really, the things that we, that the only thing that I need to add is this. And that creates a native image. And I'm going to use the tiny builder because that you know, streamlines things to the extent, maximum extent possible uh, using the Pakato Build Pack uh, tiny builder. But this is the this is the money line right here, and this allows us to create a native image. So we have a, a fully native image, and again, as I mentioned, there are trade offs, and with various different frameworks and solutions and ways of getting to native images for Java applications, uh, you know, there are some sometimes some very awkward or disappointing trade offs that happen, that you know, um, sacrifices that are made. And of course, when you're talking about building native images, you have to know everything ahead of time. The Spring Boot and Spring in general is, is very dynamic and, and has been by its nature for a, quite some time. And we don't want to sacrifice that dynamic behavior, but we want to give you options. And we want to give you those options in ways that allow you to fully leverage what you've been doing for perhaps years and building that experience without having to just take that and throw that all away. Because uh, some other options that you might look at employing pretty much require a greenfield approach uh, and require a lot of, of very complicated or, or restrictive compromises. And we don't want to do that. We wanted to take an approach, the Spring Team wanted to give you the ability to work with pretty much any Spring application that's, that's recent and up to date and take that those inputs and make it into a native application. At least have that option without significant retooling, without significant changes, without just throwing it away and starting over. And I, I'm sure you're familiar with Pet Clinic. Pet Clinic is an application that was uh, that was created to kind of exercise some of the capabilities and show some of the capabilities of, of various Spring components and Spring in a Spring Boot application. And Pet Clinic is a, a small monolithic application, right? And Pet Clinic runs as a native image. So this gives you an idea, and, and by the way, uh, Spring Native is very much not yet GA. It's still considered experimental. It's very mature and is becoming more mature every day, more polished every day. But it's it's still considered experimental and yet Pet Clinic and so many other applications run under it. And you can take your application, chances are, add a line and you're up and running with a native image. So gosh, it just it's so painless and so developer first and frictionless that I just Love it. I love it. So, so let's go ahead and, and rebuild this again and see what we come up with. Okay, let's go ahead and build this. Maybe that's right. Build image. 
how let's create a native image, a native application, and, and build a container image around that. Again, using a okay, build packs to do the heavy lifting for us. And now I'll go make a coffee. Take a quick peek at our images. We see that we have, I'll just clean that up a little bit. And we can see that we now have a customer's image that is built with a native image application. So let's go ahead and run that. Customers 0.1-snapshot. And we're up and running. It's just so fast, so easy. And it uses the same, uh, I guess, muscle memory. It's a frictionless uh, process that you're used to using in your normal day-to-day -day build cycles. And it takes so many options and places at your disposal with very little effort or pretty much no effort on your part. So with that, I'll go ahead and hand that off, pass you on, and thanks so much for coming. Thanks so much for uh, checking out this very exciting uh, path to deployment, path to production. So on to you. Now we've got a recipe for packaging the application. We could deploy it to production right now, but we wouldn't last very long. We need to instrument our application to support observability and to better integrate with the platform. To help us with this, let's turn to our pal, Cora Eberklade, in this segment called Cora the Cloud Explorer. So yeah, there's this new, you know, relatively new buzzword, observability. So it's worth taking a moment to think about, um, you know, how that's different from the kind of monitoring and alerting that we were doing for the last couple of, you know, decades, if, if not longer, right? Um, so I thought of maybe an analogy to make it a little bit, a little bit more fun to think about it. Right. But like, let's say you've got a friend, right. And your friend is feeling ill. You can see that your friend is feeling ill right there. Maybe they're sweating, maybe they're pale. You can monitor their, their pulse or their blood pressure, and even maybe put a little beeper on so that if it goes above or below a certain threshold, you're notified to that it's becoming more urgent. Um, and you can talk to your friend, right. You, your friend basically knows everything about how they're feeling. So they could tell you I'm nauseous, I'm dizzy, etc. Um, you kind of understand your friend's surroundings, right? You, you, they're, they're, they're maybe that breakfast, you know, in their apartment, you can kind of see like, you know, what, what do you have there? Uh, do you have any allergies? Um, were you exposed to anything else? You know, what could be wrong? And um, that's, that's kind of like the way that we would monitor our traditional monolithic uh, three, four tier stack architectures. You know, your monolith is basically the uh, the single place where most of the information that you need is coming from right you don't have to look at more than one log file to understand the life of a single user request to look at all of the different uh, behaviors that you might expect you can monitor maybe the the few virtual machines that your app is running on um, a couple of network hops from between tiers of your stack but you kind of have a pretty contained system and we're looking for sort certain specific characteristics now if we could take a step back, we might see that actually our friend is not acting alone. Our friend is at a party with maybe a couple hundred other people. And, um, and we might notice that it's not just our friend that's feeling ill, but actually a handful of other people are feeling ill. And so if we can get sort of a broader, a broader understanding of the um, interactions between the various folks at the party, and the other elements that are there, then we can start to maybe understand what's going on, right? So maybe there's a group of people that are dancing together, a group of people that are, that are you know, sitting and eating, talking together, or a few people that interact at the bar. And we might realize that, that actually the commonality between all of the people who are experiencing these same symptoms is related to the fact that they were all eating from the same uh, shellfish buffet, Right. And so then we can start to say, well, OK, well, um, what what is the chain of supply for that shellfish buffet? And we might realize that it's all coming from a particular caterer. And then when we dig into that caterer, we might realize that actually they have a faulty refrigerator. 
right? But only by understanding the whole system do we really get enough context to be able to ask the right questions and uh, do a proper root cause analysis or even just to understand what's going on in the system, right? It's not these 200 random people, but actually they're all at a party and they're, they're inter interrelated in different ways, right? Both with each other and with the various layers of the stack, right? So whether it be the microservices in your, in your application or the platform like Kubernetes that they are running on or the virtualized, uh, the cloud infrastructure or the actual physical infrastructure, et cetera, um, and all of the load balancers and the meshes and things like that, right? So uh, we want to be able to get a comprehensive understanding of the system based on this external observation. Now, to do that, of course, there's no magical tool where we just throw our stuff at it and, and, the, and the tool tells us, well, this is what's going on, right? Rather, observability is something that we have to consider from the very beginning, right? When we're coding our application, much like security, much like testing, these are things that you can't just wait till you're farther down the life cycle to consider, but rather uh, our developers have to be aware of these concerns and start building them into their apps from the onset. So the theme of the day, of course, is how what Spring Boot is offering in order to enable um, us to meet these challenges on Kubernetes at scale on a distributed environment. So the question that we, we want to look at right now is what if, what is Spring Boot doing to enable us to achieve these objectives, right? So um, I wanted to start with uh, I got I got a I got a copy of, of your app. Thanks for that. Uh, you're making this easy. And so I wanted to start by looking at the palm file. Now uh, you've already very wisely included the Spring Boot Starter Actuator. Um, so Actuator, just by including it in our POM file, is going to add these you know, production-ready features to our application with absolutely no additional work from us as developers. Um, of course, to access these features, we have to add one other thing, which is right here, in the um, application.properties file, we want to uncomment this line right here. Management endpoints web exposure include everything. So of course, if you, on a production system, you might, might want to be a little bit more selective. You might want to put some kind of um, authorization protection on these endpoints or, or you know, be only ex expose some of them but not others. Maybe expose them on a different port that's not your app port. But for the purposes of, of this demo, we can just go ahead and expose all of them on the default port. So if I go ahead and start that application, you can see even just here in the logging output, exposing 13 endpoints beneath the base path slash actuator, right? So let's go ahead and see what is at that base path. So we go to localhost 8080 slash actuator. And so here are those endpoints that this um, actuator starter has added by default into our application. So for example, beans, right? Slash actuator slash beans shows us all of the various beans that have been created as our application started up. Um, let's see another interesting one. So health, let's click on health here. Health tells us that our app is okay. Great, good to know. Uh, info. Info is, by default, info is actually empty, but it's a good place to add information about your app. You can take a look at that a little bit later on. Uh, config props is another interesting one, right? The final configuration of your application might be uh, a reconciliation of various application properties files, maybe some environment variables, maybe some command line parameters. So this is gonna tell you the definitive set of key value pairs that make up the final configuration of your app. And what's cool and fairly a recent addition is that it'll also tell you the source of where the properties came from, right? Because if they, if you have properties set in multiple places and one overrides the other, this will tell you where the one that actually took effect came from. So for example, you can see here that um, the management endpoints web, uh, the expose include star that we, we just set that right in our properties file. We just uncommented that. We set the value to star that is coming from application.properties line four, column 43, we can validate that. 
In fact, this is line four, and over here, the bottom right of the screen, IntelliJ is telling us that indeed that is line four, column 43. So we can tell exactly where that came from, which is pretty cool. Uh, environment information, loggers information, a heap dump and a thread jump dump. Um, we've got uh, metrics here. All kinds of different metric metrics about HTTP server requests, different JVM characteristics, thread, garbage collection, different classes that are loaded, uh, process time, CPU, files, etc. Um, this application uses an R2DBC database, so, so that is contributing metrics to this collection of metrics, system, CPU, et cetera. And we can take any one of these, so let's take, for example, this top one, HTTP server requests, and just tack it on here. And we can get some detail, and we know that we've hit this with seven uh, requests so far, all these actuator endpoints that we've been hitting. And we could uh, dig in. So this is a pretty generic name for this property. So if we wanted to dig in and know if some of them are, uh, you know, uh, what kind of accept, what kind of exception they may have elicited, or what method. These are all GET requests. Which URIs we've been hitting, right? These are all the ones that we just clicked on, um, etc. The status 404 200. Uh, this, all this information is available through tags. And this approach of using a simple sort of top level name and the detail information through tags is something called dimensional metrics as opposed to hierarchical, which was the older way of doing, doing things. This makes it much easier for a system that's receiving this information to help us um, query the results and correlate it across different applications. So this is dimensional metrics provided by a library called Micrometer. That actuator is is uh, transitively relying on. And micrometer is sort of this uh, generic facade that allows us to capture these metrics and integrate with different kinds of systems. Um, Prometheus might be one that you've heard of, for example, or Datadog or things like that. So um, we've also got mappings here. So any kind of request mapping would be exposed here. So you've got the actuator endpoints. We would also have the customer's endpoint. That is the one that's coded into our code. Um, right, we've got our, we have, but there's an endpoint called get drip. We'll be using that later uh, and so on, right? Um, pause, down, these are all coffee. These are all endpoints and the get, get customer's endpoint, which is the one that um, Josh was coding earlier, right? So. A lot of great information out of the box available through Actuator. Of course, it's not that helpful to have to go through these one by one, especially if you're talking about a microservice architecture that is composed of many uh, individual components. This is not really intended for that, but rather to be exported to some kind of tooling that can uh, use this to make it more um, easily usable by us. So let's look at that next. Um, so if we go back to our POM file here, what I want to do is, um, so Josh, you had already included actually uh, a starter called Wavefront. So I just took it out for a second just to enable it a little bit later in this demo. So I'm going to comment back in this other dependency called Wavefront Spring Boot Starter. And that requires us to include this dependency management section with the Wavefront Spring Boot bomb and a version. Of course, that version, we have to make sure that that's also commented in. So basically what we've done here is enabled the integration of Spring Boot with one particular observability tool called Wavefront. Now there are other choices. If you just go here to start.spring.io, if you, if you were to add dependencies and type observability, then this will filter out all of the options um, for the different integrations that are provided between Spring Boot and some of these different observability tools, right? So some of them are for um, query languages like Prometheus, for example, um, Graphite, hierarchical metric system. There's um, things that offer uh, dimensional time series, um, distributed tracing libraries. So we've got Sleuth here. There's all these different kinds of integrations that you can use. And we're just going to highlight Wavefront. Um, Wavefront does 
metrics. It does um, the dimensional time series. It does traces and spans for distributed tracing. And one really cool thing is that the Spring Boot team has actually included in that starter for Wavefront a configuration for uh, a dashboard out of the box. So we'll see that in a second, how quickly you can hit the ground running uh, using this particular starter. But feel free to try you know, the ones on that list. And, and, and of course, other integrations are possible as well. Uh, there's a lot of great tools out there. So um, now that we've commented in Wavefront, all we've got to do is restart that application. And so here in the output, you'll notice there's a line here that says publishing metrics for Wavefront meter registry every minute. So just by adding this um, starter, the application has negotiated um, connection to the SaaS product called Wavefront and is publishing metrics every minute. And uh, this negotiation of access that it's done has resulted in this, um, these two properties here, the await an API token and the URI. And we can actually, we could just go ahead and paste that into our file here and then it'll just reuse that instead of pulling it uh, into the log file every time. Um, so basically we can hit this URL um, and immediately see that there's actually this dashboard provided out of the box. So we'll, we'll, we'll make sure to populate some more data in there a second. But, um, and here we have a, a nice welcome window. Welcome to VMware Tanzu Observability by Wavefront. So it's part of the VMware Tanzu Observability Suite. It's originally written by um, a company called Wavefront that was acquired by uh, VMware. And you can see that it is, uh, that there is a free tier that has certain allowances in terms of what you can use. Um, and, and then this particular dashboard is something provided by the Spring team specifically for Spring Boot applications. So really great stuff right out of the box. And there's no data coming through quite yet, right? It might take another minute or so, but, uh, but you can tell from some of these titles that you're, we're pulling from that information that is exposed through Actuator, right? So the Actuator information is being published to Wavefront and Wavefront is exposing it through this uh, these different charts and graphs. So we have CPU utilization, the different load on the system. There is um, uh, buffer pool information, file descriptors, log events, Tomcat sessions, uh, all kinds of information. So let's start sending some requests so that we actually see something more interesting here. Now, the other thing I did in the code, of course, we've got that customer's endpoint, right? This is a customer's endpoint that um, was originally coded into the app. So we can go ahead and hit that endpoint for sure. Localhost, and we'll just say customers here. And we can check this. I think I had that set up to every second. Okay, send a customer request every second. But I also added a couple of others. I made a coffee rest controller here with a coffee endpoint and a drip endpoint. And really, what this is at the at the risk of having uh, Mark and Nate be really angry with me, the coffee endpoint returns an error. Error, HTTP status code, I am a teapot. No coffee in the teapot. Out of coffee, have some tea. So let's go ahead and generate some errors. And here we go. Coffee. And we'll have the coffee, how about an error every five seconds? And then the other endpoint is called drip. So don't be too mad because you can brew some more coffee. It's just gonna take 10 seconds, right? Every second it's gonna drip, brew another drop of our drip coffee and it's gonna do 10 drops. So let's go ahead and add that endpoint right here. Localhost drip. And we'll have that repeating every 20 seconds, I think is what I had it set to. Okay, so make sure that this one's running. Yes, okay. So now we can go back to Wavefront and let this refresh. 
And let's see what we have here. All right, so our app has been up for four minutes using 0.12% of our CPU, no block threads, and we've got 4.88 error events. So, um, so it's pretty incredible that just out of the box, right, you can see here even the, the top requests, um, we're mostly getting customer requests, we've done 80 of those already, uh, top exceptions, um, we've got our top failed request, which is our coffee, uh, let's see what else is here, again, more uh, slow requests as well. Uh, if we were running a, a multi-app application, we could include traces and spans and maybe we would find out that not it's one particular hop in a multi-hop user request that's slower, but right now we're just dealing with one app. Uh, and so on, tons of great information all coming from the actuator uh, that we saw before. Um, so, you know, Spring Boot has helped us uh, get pretty far uh, into the running by providing us this, this dashboard. Um, again, remember there's a whole bunch of other tools. You can look at not only these, but there's other tools on the market as well. All have their um, advantages and their, and, their, and their nice features. So um, just keep that in mind. And um, so that's, that's a wavefront and that's out of the box what you've got going on for you. Now, um, now, the observability tool, in this case Wavefront, is not the only system that needs to get information about how the app is doing. Uh, for example, Kubernetes itself wants to know if our app is okay because Kubernetes is responsible for sending traffic to our app or restarting our app when necessary. And so right now, by default, we've got this uh, health endpoint that just says up or down that we could tell Kubernetes to use. And so if this happens to go down, then Kubernetes can decide if it's stopping traffic or restarting the app. Uh, and as long as this is up, then Kubernetes will know that the app is okay. But, but even there, to know that Kubernetes is really checking two different things, right? One is, is the, does the app need to be restarted? And the other one is, is the app ready to receive traffic? Uh, we can already tell that there's a, a discordance there between the, the granularity of the information that Kubernetes would like to know about and the information that's being provided by this single health endpoint. So we can do a little better. Um, so let's go to our application properties file. So the one thing we're going to do, first of all, is we're going to say that that health endpoint just telling us up or down is not informative enough, we wanna know also a little bit more detail about what are the different factors that go into determining whether or not that endpoint is up or down. Uh, I can just show you even what difference that makes by just restarting the app. We can refresh this now and see, oh, in fact, this up status came from a check on disk space a ping, and because we've included the R2DBC library in our POM file, that kind of information, it runs a validate query on the database uh, to verify that the database is up and ready. And so it's these three characteristics that are contributing to the status being up, right? If the database were bad, this would be down and the overall status would be down. Now again, here, it's there's no not really a correlation between this information and what Kubernetes wants from us. So again, um, we can do a little better. And so I'm going to uncomment this line here. Now, management endpoint health probes enabled equals true. I have to enable this because I'm doing this demo on my local application. If this app were being deployed on Kubernetes or in a cloud environment, the Spring Boot app would actually automatically detect that it's on the cloud and it would enable this uh, by default. So you may not need to set that. But let's go ahead and start that back up. And we'll check this again. And now we see that we've added another group. This group includes liveness and readiness. And so these are really custom built to correspond to the things that Kubernetes wants from us. And so we can see that the liveness state is up and the readiness state is up. In fact, we can inquire about them individually. We've got liveness over here 
and we have readiness over here. Both of them are up right now, right? And uh, so these may change based on, you know, Spring Boot doing its own thing may know when to change these um, in some cases. But maybe uh, we want to be, have a hand in determining when our app is actually ready for traffic or when it needs to be restarted. And for that, I've written here a couple of examples in this availability rest controller. So two additional methods here. So down, for example, if we send an HTTP POST request to slash down, we're going to take advantage of this um, event called an availability change event. And we're going to publish an event and use this liveness state uh, broken setting to make sure that the uh, liveness responds down. And uh, also uh, this one, pause, will do something similar where for a period of 30 seconds, it will set the readiness state to refusing traffic, and then it'll send, set it back to a happy state of accepting traffic. So we've got two endpoints to influence the response of those two um, uh, actuator endpoints. So for example, HTTP post 8080, um, let's say pause, and we can go here and say that our readiness should now be out of service. It's gonna be out of service for 30 seconds. So on my machine, nothing's gonna happen, right? Because Kubernetes is not here to check this endpoint and do anything about it. But if this were running on Kubernetes, and you and of course you have to do that extra step of telling Kubernetes, you have to give this uh, endpoint to Kubernetes. Um, but then Kubernetes would realize that this is out of service and it would actually stop sending traffic to the service for this application. So this is gonna head back, this is gonna uh, switch back to a happy state uh, in the meantime, but if we check the status of the app over here, oh, I think I missed it. I'll show it to you with it down. Okay, this is up again. Okay, I'll show it to you with the other one. Um, if we hit the down, then our, our readiness is still up, but our liveness is now down. And so at this point, when Kubernetes notices that the liveness is down, it'll actually restart the container in the pod. And here, that you can see that that liveness, if the liveness is down, the whole thing is considered to be down, right? All of these feed up to the top level status. Uh, but now Kubernetes knows, knows that in this case, it's not that it's supposed to stop traffic because the app is overloaded or something, but actually that it needs to restart the application. Which actually brings us to the next point, right? Because what if Kubernetes does want to just kill our application? Well, we, we're grateful because that'll probably help our app. We probably need that little reboot. But if there's requests that are in flight, we probably want to give our application a chance to gracefully shut down, let those requests finish um, before Kubernetes uh, actually restarts it. So that's another feature that's built into Spring Boot. We have this server shutdown graceful um, characteristic here. So right now, for example, I could do an HTTP on 8080, I'm going to stream this. Remember our drip endpoint? That was our slow request. If I, right now, hit this, uh, if I hit this endpoint, so it's brewing drops, and I can go back here and try to kill the app. So the app just stops, it just shuts down. And um, you can see that it got to drop seven and then there's an HTTP error, right? We didn't really allow that request to uh, complete before we just killed the application. So that's the default behavior where shut, server shutdown is immediate. Uh, we can, however, add this server shutdown graceful and also uh, we can set timeouts so that it doesn't wait forever, but rather allowing 30 seconds for each phase of the shutdown, for example. But 30 seconds is plenty of time for our drip endpoint to finish running. Um, and you just have to make sure there's a timeout on the Kubernetes end as well. So just make sure you're, you're keeping that in mind as you set this one. But this way, if we run our app again, and now 
send another drip request, and then go back to our run and kill our app. You can see that it's commencing a graceful shutdown waiting for the active request to finish. Go back here and see that drops eight and nine, and then, only then, did it actually shut down. Graceful shutdown complete. So that's another cool feature that's built in for Kubernetes. Now, another thing I wanted to show you was um, this info endpoint that we looked at earlier. So this info endpoint that we looked at earlier that right now just returns these empty brackets, it would be interesting to add some additional information in there because if we do discover there's a problem, for example, one interesting, one, one useful bit of information to know would be what git commit does this code actually correspond to, right? Or other information that you might want to include. So um, in our POM file, there is a library, a plugin. Actually, this was already in here because Josh is super responsible. I commented it out for illustration purposes, but commenting back in. So this is during the build. Uh, it's going to invoke this plugin that's going to get get information uh, for us and include that in the info. Now, because that is during the build, uh, we do want to do a Maven. Uh, let's do a clean package. And what that will do is in the target directory, in our classes, it generates this git.properties file that has all of this git information, including the commit ID. So it can include some of this information in the, inf in the info endpoint. That's one thing. And then uh, you can actually be more arbitrary. So you can add, for example, if I set info dot key value pair, that would also show up in the info endpoint. And of course you can do things programmatically in the code. So let's see this in action. Now, if I refresh this page, suddenly we have foobar from our application properties file, but also the git information, the branch, the commit ID, and the commit time. So pretty cool. And then just the last thing that I want to mention is that I know you've already been chatting with Mark, and Mark um, was helping to build an image for this application. And the only thing that we need to add to the setup that uh, Mark did would be this one environment variable uh, because for Wavefront and Graal VM combination, uh, you, uh, you just need to enable this property for successful uh, compilation to enable the uh, communication between the application and the Wavefront service in the cloud. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and rebuild this. Maven, spring boot, build image, and I am going to move that on forward down the chain. I know this is going to take a few minutes, uh, so we don't have to watch this like coffee dripping. Thanks for calling on me. It's been a lot of fun and good luck with this app. Alrighty, our application is ready for production. And for a lot of people today, production is Kubernetes. So let's turn to our pal, Paul Chokowski, in this segment called Better Call Paul to see how we can take our application and deploy it into Kubernetes. Oh, hi, Josh. How's it going? <laughs> Pretty good. Um, You know, I love it when you call me because you never call me with an agenda. You just called a chat and see what's up. Most people, whenever they call me, they're only calling me because, I don't know, they want some free Kubernetes consulting or something. And I'm just glad that's not the sort of relationship we have. Oh, oh, right. Uh, you want some help deploying something to Kubernetes? All right, sure. Um, I can... I can help with that, Josh. So where is your application? You've already got it built in a container in your registry, right? 
<laughs> no. Um, have you got a GitHub repo? <laughs> All right. Well, that's a start. Let's uh, let's figure that out from there. So I assume I can just Maven. Let's spring boot run and see it working, right, Josh? Let's see if we can do that. Make sure I've at least got Java and stuff on my machine because it's been a while. All right, is this is this what it's supposed to do, Josh? Yes. Okay, great. So if I can run it here, then we're in for a good start. Oh, I should I should grab this and copy it into my application properties before I compile. Just why is that? Oh, so that'll just make running it quicker because it's not creating a new Wavefront account to send our metrics to every time. Okay. Uh, well, let's do that. Okay. So now I need to, I guess, build an image, right? Um, how do I even do that? Do I have to write a Docker file? You haven't got a Docker file in here. What? Wait, I can just, I can just do a Maven build image. Okay. Um, and then how do I name the image? Fingers crossed. Okay, this is looking good. Looking good. So I just wait now. How long? Is it? it shouldn't take long though, right? Because it's a small app. Sorry, what? Native image? I, I I don't know what a native image is. Oh, so when we build a native, you said it was a Growl native image. It gives us a binary we can run, just like say like a Go binary, but Java. Wow. Okay, that's cool. And it's smaller, and less memory. Okay. All right. Well, I'll take your word for it. Um, so I guess it's going to take a little while to build then. So, uh, I'll go make a coffee or something and we'll check back in a bit. That uh, was quite the adventure, but it looks like we got an image. Uh, I guess we can run it and make sure it works. Okay, that was pretty quick. That was pretty quick. So what's uh, next? I guess we will push it like so. Uh, so this is pushing it up to my registry. If we can look at that here, registry. All right, here we go. So here is my registry. You can see my image has push, finished pushing. Uh, and this is the new version right here. 
Uh, and you can see I've got some previous images here, uh, some of which have already been vulnerability scanned. Now this is a non growl VM build one, and you can see, you can see it's got like 52 potential vulnerabilities. Now, a lot of these aren't real vulnerabilities, um, you know, whatever. Uh, whereas you can see the growl one only has seven low vulnerabilities. So there's probably not a lot to worry about there. Uh, and we could, if we wanted to, and had time go through them and try and remediate them, but I think we're fine. So, um, uh, yeah, so this is Harbor, it's a registry. Um, this is where we pushed our stuff to. So now it's in our registry, Josh. We should be able to uh, deploy it. All right, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to create a namespace and we'll call it Kubernetes after the project. And now we're going to start running some kubectl commands. And so we're going to do, first of all, um, because I'm running a, uh, I'm running a Kubernetes tool called kube context, I can do this. And that sets my default namespace to be the Kubernetes namespace. And that way I don't have to keep typing dash n or dash dash namespace when I'm doing actions. So kubectl is, well, first of all, do I have a cluster? Well, clearly I do, but let me have a quick look. So we're running a Tanzu mission control cluster, which is a hosted Tanzu Kubernetes grid Kubernetes cluster. Um, I could show you a bunch of stuff there, Josh, but you just have to trust me that this is a pretty awesome way to get your Kubernetes up and running. And it's fully managed, so I don't have to do anything. I'm not installing services or anything like that. I just say, hey, TMC, give me a cluster. So we have that. We have, I guess, a couple of Kubernetes nodes. We've got some, some resources to burn. So let's go ahead and create our first deployment. So now often you'll do a, like kubectl apply and throw a manifest at it, but we don't have manifests. So I'm going to use this to create manifest. Um, so first of all, we need to point at our image, which I can copy and paste from previous command to save us some typing. Um, and then we need to give it a name. And then I'm going to do dash o yaml. And I'm going to do um, the point but yeah. Uh oh. <laughs> Create mint. Wow, that's a that's a pretty special one. So not only has that created a deployment in Kubernetes, but it's also given us a deployment.yaml file, which we could then apply. Now I put that in our root directory right here. Uh, so what I should do is make the um, Kate's manifest and then deploy it, move it to Kate's manifests. And that's going to keep it a little bit clean. So that's a deployment. And that will then have created a replica set, which will create a pod, which is just how Kubernetes manages things. Um, and so you can see we have our pod running. So I can now do a port forward um, into my deployment customer. Um, and we're doing 8080 is, I think, your port. Then I'll just background it. Right. And so now I should be able to do this um, 8080. Well, first of all, make sure that works. So we get a not bound. I believe you said I had to do something like that. Right? So that's our app responding through the port forward. Now, I think we now get health and actuators and stuff by default. Um, if you have 
them set up in your POM, and I assume you've got them set up in your POM. So let's just do this. Uh, actuators uh, help. Uh oh. Actuators, did I spell it wrong? Actuator. There she is. Uh, and it's showing us up and it's telling us we have readiness and liveness probes available. So I can do that. Uh, and I can do that. And that's pretty useful. Uh, but one thing uh, we want to think about is we also don't want to expose these actuators out to the internet. So let's do a let's do a couple of things. Let's go ahead and um, edit our uh, newly created manifest. And we want to do a few things. Um, and I want to find my containers. So here's my container spec. Now, I'm going to do a few things from memory. First of all, I'm going to set termi termination grace period seconds to 30. Uh, I'm going to do uh, inside my container, I'm going to set an environment variable. Management server port. And I'm going to set a value of 9001. And then we're going to set a liveness probe. DP get actuator health liveness and port. 9001. And then we'll just see if we can do this. If I do set paste, I believe that will do that. Yep. And then we can just fix this word here up. Readiness. Readiness. Now, the difference between these two is liveness. Probe will check to see if your application is alive. And if it's not, it's actually going to restart the pod because it's going to assume you're crashed. Readiness probe just verifies that your application is up and ready and listening. And we can use that in, with services to make sure that it doesn't try and access uh, pods that aren't ready. So hopefully I've got my indenting right here. And so now we can apply that like so. Oh boy. 76 did not find accepted key. Oh, that's why. Hopefully that's it. Well, um, when in doubt, yeah, when in doubt, use force. So now we should be doing get pods. Um, and we can see the old version terminating and the new version coming up. And we can see now just the new version is running. So uh, let's do OK, get all. So we'll see that we have our uh, deployment, our replica set, and our pod. 
and our pod is only 28 seconds, but it is live. Um, do we still have that port forward active? We do. Let's, let's just drop it and do another one. No, let's not do that. Let's go ahead and create a service. Um, so uh, we want to do expose deployment customer port 8080. Uh, and again, we'll do dash o YAML and we'll push it at uh, Kate's manifests service YAML. All right, Josh, so now we've got a service running. But you see we have a cluster IP, but not an external IP. And that means that this is only currently available inside the cluster. So if you had a Spring Cloud Gateway or something that was going to be acting in front of this, you wouldn't need to go further because you would use the Spring Cloud Gateway as your entrance. But since we don't have that yet, at least, uh, we can create an ingress. And that's going to give us a way for stuff outside the cluster to get in. And it's also going to do a couple of other interesting things that I will show you. Now, this is going to be a fun command. And so you're going to have to bear with me. And we'll see if we can get it right. Create ingress customer class equals default. Right. And then we need to set rules. So we need to tell it what uh, what host and path we send to the service. So I'm going to say everything that comes to crm.s1t.blah is going to go to my customer service, this guy, on port 8080. And I want to do TLS. So I'm going to tell it to expect a TLS secret. Now, because I want to do TLS, I need to tell it that I want Cert Manager to create a certificate form. So we do that by creating an annotation, uh, specifying a cluster issue, which um, this is something I run on all of my uh, clusters using uh, Cert Manager, use our Let's Encrypt cluster issuer. And then finally, again, we're going to route that out to our manifest directory. Fingers crossed. I got that right. I guess I did. Let's clean out our screen. Hey, get all. Now we don't see our ingress here, and that is because get all is a lie. So we can do get all and ingress. And here you can see we now have our ingress, and that is our hosts, and that is the ports it's listening on. And then the other thing we should check, and we can add that to the list, is certificates. Let me just do cert. Here you can see we have a certificate called CRM secret, and it claims to be ready. And what that means is I can grab this right here, and I can do HTTPS that customers and Boom. So we have our application being accessed from outside the cluster, just my, via my web browser, over TLS with a DNS name set up. And so the way that works is I have Cert Manager running, and that takes care of building out the certificate. But I also have external DNS running in my cluster, and external DNS we'll create DNS records for you as services and ingresses come up. 
And that gives me a ton of benefits because I don't need to manage those things. And if that certificate expires, Cert Manager is going to deal with that and rotate the certificate for me. So I'm getting a bunch of extra like operations goodness uh, without having to do a ton of work. So Josh, we're running in Kubernetes. Um, I have a, I have a thing to send to you um, with the Kuba. Let me just do a git add. So I have a thing to send to you. I don't know what those are. I'll ignore that. But you can see we have really our Kate, Kate manifests are the important things. Uh, clearly, we need some git ignore bits, uh, but that's fine. All right. So I will send those manifests up to you. Um, but I don't think your story ends here, Josh, because I've helped you get this running in Kubernetes, but it is in no way shall perform uh, production ready. So just because you're running in Kubernetes doesn't need mean you don't need to think about operational things. So I assume that this is a CRM, you have a list of customers, and you're probably getting and putting those into a database, and we're probably using an in-memory database. So you'll probably want to use an out-of-memory database like Postgres, and that means you're going to either want to run that in Kubernetes, which sounds a little scary at first, but you can do it, uh, or you're going to run it somewhere else. You'll need to configure your app to use it. So you probably need to use a config map to set application properties. Uh, and then you're also going to want to back it up and test your backups. And then we can start talking about calling it production ready. And I'm going to tell you that I am not the best person to help you with that. Thankfully, we both know Tiffany Jernigan, who is very smart when it comes to running production workloads on Kubernetes. So why don't, uh, why don't we call this done? I'll get back to my day and you can hassle Tiffany for a while. By this point, we've tackled everything in, in what I would call day one concerns. These are all the concerns having to do with incepting the service. But day two will fast approach, and that's the business of keeping the service stable and in production. To look at some of the things that we can care, care about in that particular realm, we're going to turn to our pal, Tiffany Yernigan, in this segment called Tiffany Tackles Tech. Tiffany? Thanks, Paul, for everything you just set up for me. So let's start and make sure that everything's still good. So let's do a K or kubectl is just alias, get all and ingress since all does not actually include ingress. Okay, cool. So everything looks good. Everything's up and running. So right now what we have is everything is running from within or all the values are coming from an internal database. So if we want to just take a look at some of the values for that, we can use curl or HTTP. So if we do curl, and then we have the host there, slash customers, JQ, and I set it up a little differently. So we can see, hey, we have A, B, and C. Awesome. Cool. So now let's try to do this so that we're actually using external database. So what I'll want to do is I want to use Helm, and I'm going to create a PostgreSQL database. So first you need to get the repository. So if we do a Helm, re Helm repo add uh, Bitnami, and I already have Bitnami, so I can just use what I already have there. Okay, so now I'll want to do a Helm install. And so I'm gonna use, create, call it customers DB. It's gonna be PostgreSQL, as I mentioned, and it's gonna take in a values file, which has a username and a password. So we're gonna install that. Cool, so now I can just go and copy these for a bit later. So now the next thing we need to do is we need to get this deployment to know about our new database. So I'm gonna use environment variables and seekers to be able to do this, and then I'll show you what's happening there. So. I'm just going to do a diff. So right now, basically, 
The difference between these two files is that I'm adding environment variables. So I am setting the Spring profile to be cloud and therefore anything in there will be used. And then I have a database URL. So if that's in that profile, it's going to be overridden for what I have here. I have my username, I have the password, and this password is being pulled from a secret that I created. So let's apply this file. So basically, it's just going to update the deployment that we have right now. Okay, cool. So if we do a k get pods, we can see that this one is now up and running. Okay, so now if we run the client for PostgreSQL, we can see what we have in there. So we have a table called customer. So we can look in there. And since based on the times of like pods coming up and down or running through it, there could be a lot more uh, parameter or like IDs, like those letters and stuff uh, that are in here than just three. So if we do a select star from customer, we can see, yeah, there's a bunch more of them now. So um, what we could do here now is I could add another letter. So if I wanted to do insert into customer and name and then values D. Okay, cool. So now if we do a select from, we can actually see the D that I just threw in here. Cool. Okay. So let's get out of that. And we can also take a look at this if we do a curl again. And we can see all of the same stuff that we just had. Okay, cool. So we know that is getting it from this database. Okay, so next let's talk about this tool called Valero. So Valero is basically used for things like backing up your cluster. Say some, you want to make sure that it backs it up every 30 days. Or you want to set up some sort of backup on your own. And then you want to be able to restore from that. Like a big point of it is like for disaster recovery or migrating your cluster. So it also, it'll, it'll, it can do this for specific namespaces, the entire cluster. It'll be for Kubernetes resources and then also for persistent volumes. So I'm not going to go through the installation process of it. There are other videos for that. So say if you go to tanzu.vmware.com slash developer, there is a guide in there that will show you how to do this. So I'm going to show you the install using uh, Tanzu Mission Control because it, or I'm going to show you it from Tanzu Mission Control because I all you have to do is click a button to enable it. So if I go here, um, we can see down at the bottom, this is the cluster that I have. So if we go down to the bottom here, we can see that there is data protection and this previously was asking me to enable it. Uh, in short, Tanzu Mission Control basically is management for multiple clusters, and these could be clusters that Tanzu Mission Control uses TKG or Tanzu Kubernetes Grid to create, or you can have your own uh, ones that you created on various providers, vSphere, etc., and you can manage them all from this one place. So now that we have that, I could go and create a backup if I wanted, and there's two ways to be able to do this. So we can do this here. We can also use the Valero CLI. And also if you're trying to install it just like command line for installing in your cluster, you can just go to valero.io and also that again, the guide that I was mentioning. So I could back up the entire cluster. I could back up a selected namespace. So let's uh, do a selected namespace. And we can see this. I'm going to do Booternetes since that's the one I'm using. And then this is where you can choose, okay, what schedule do I want it on? And if you're doing this in the command line, then you would want to, it, you can set it as like a at, and then like week, one week late, or however often it is, or using actual cron. And I'll show you 
a bit if I get time to for how to do that. So right, it's a good idea to have something back up consistently, but for the purposes of this, I'm just going to do a backup right now. So I can decide how long I want it to last for. So then I'm going to just call it first backup. But really, if you're actually doing this, you should name it something useful. Um, and this isn't. So if we do a create, so we can see that that one is pending. We can see that we have nothing that's for a schedule. There's no restores. So if we look at this with Valero, so you can do Valero dash H. So we can see that there's like backup, there's a restore. So if we do Valero backup, we can see some things there. If I want to do Valero backup get, we can see this one that I did something ran with and broke uh, previously. And then we can see the one that I just created. So that's pretty cool. So let me grab water real quick and I'll be right back. Okay, I'm back. Wait a second. Somehow my database is uninstalled. That's a problem. Okay, so let's take a look at that real quick and see what it's finding. So I'm just gonna do the curl again. And yeah, as expected, it's not finding that database. So I could go and just create a new one, but then it won't have that special character that I just put in there or any of the other ones that showed up over time. Um, so I guess this is where it's a good thing that I saved a backup. So let's look at how to restore. So I can also do it via the command line. So if I wanted to do a Valero restore, and that's a previous one. So of a restore dash H. So you can uh, do a create. And then here you can also see that you can give it a from backup and the name of the backup. So for this one, I'll just do this. And I called it first backup, I believe. Okay, cool. So we can see that if we want, we can also take a look over here. We can see that this restore is in progress. So that's one of the nice things here as well. You can watch as things are actually happening with it. Cool, so that's completed. So let's see if my Helm chart is back. So I have this. Okay, so if I end up doing a curl again. Moment of truth. Yes, okay, it's back. Things aren't all over and exploded. All right, cool. Well, yeah, uh, that was databases in Valero for you. All right, we've got an application that's ready for production. I am so excited. We have gone from the very beginning to the very end, and all throughout this journey, we've looked at different ways to make it so that we can get to production faster and more reliably by relying on convention, by relying on automation, by paying down the technical debt that's implied by the complexity of moving to distributed systems into cloud native architectures. Remember, at the end of the day, what we want is to go faster, to be able to deliver better software faster. And there's a reason for that. To speak more about the economics of scale and the motivations for scale, we return again to our friend, Nate Shuda in a segment called Shuda Woulda Coulda. You know, it used to be so simple back in the day. We had a monolith, maybe two. We released semi-annually. We all worked on the same floor, or at least within walking distance of one another. But that's not the case today, is it? No, now we have dozens, hundreds, maybe thousands of services, and new versions are dropping every day. Your team's scattered all around the globe. Now, architecting was never easy. But now we have to deal with these massively distributed applications and geographically dispersed teams. 
which just further exacerbates the reality that there's not a lot of architects to go around. So we can't be everywhere at all times. We can't be involved with every decision. It's important that we empower our teams. We need to distribute that decision making. What's important for us as tech leads, principal engineers, lead engineers, architects, we want to establish principles and we want to leverage the power of defaults. Now, I'm not an economist. I don't play one on TV. I'm a computer scientist, but I do remember when this paper came out talking about how to get more people to save for their retirement by simply switching the default when you join a new company from you have to go out and sign up for your your retirement plan, or we just automatically enroll you and make you go unenroll if in fact you don't want to participate. Unsurprisingly, participation skyrockets at companies that do this. And this is one of the early examples of behavioral economics. And this is a powerful enough concept that it did indeed earn its, its creators a Nobel Prize. And there's a fantastic quote from this particular prize winner who says, if you want to get somebody to do something, make it easy. Well, that's what we're trying to do. We need to use that to our advantage. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. Hang on a sec here, Nate. I'm a computer scientist. I'm a software engineer. I'm not an economist. What does this have to do with me? We want to yield the power of defaults, take that to use that to our advantage. And we want to make the right choice, the easy choice. At the end of the day, distributed systems have similar needs, monitoring, circuit breakers, consumer driven contracts, gateways, streams, externalized configuration, functions, service discovery, load balancing, documentation. And I could go on and on and on, but I have a limited amount of time. We can't afford to reinvent all of that on every project. I can't afford to have every developer make their own version of this. If they did, it would make suburban sprawl look like a lovely spring day. One of the beauties of spring is that it allows us as architects, tech leads, lead engineers, principal engineers to free ourselves up to focus on critical design decisions while empowering our teams to solve critical business problems. Now, it should be pretty obvious. There's a lot of ways to fail with distributed applications. One of the things I love about Spring is it's here to help you. It's here to help your teams, your applications, help everybody sleep better at night. At the end of the day, we get judged based on our ability to put code into production and deliver business value. And that's ultimately what this is about. So let's leverage that. Let's take advantage of it. Let's make the easy thing the right thing. All right, we did it. We took an idea from concept to customer. We were able to evolve the code get it ready for production, and then deploy it into production, and then maintain production. We did this using automation and velocity. We did this using consistency and strong opinions. This allows us to scale, to address greater heights, to meet greater demand. Uh, and we also get better working, scalable software in production as a result. So it's a win-win all around. We hope you got something from this, and we hope to hear from you. Here is our contact information. Should you have any questions, comments, feedback, or whatever, we're always happy to hear from you. As always, and on behalf of the entire crew that presented uh, in this uh, show, as always, and on behalf of everyone uh, in this presentation, thank you so much for hanging out with us. Have a good day, stay safe, and enjoy your journey to production.